Logistics comprises the means and arrangements which work out the plans of strategy and tactics. Strategy decides where to act. Logistics brings the troops to this point. Jomini, Précis de la Art de la Guerre, 1838. Chapter 19. Building Blocks. The Logistics Revolution. 19.1. McLean's Insight. Inside the Box. Malcolm McLean, 1913 to 2001, an independent truck owner-operator out of Fayetteville, North Carolina, frustrated by the delays associated with waiting at the New Jersey waterfront to unload his cotton for shipment to Istanbul, and concerned about hauling empty truck trailers back to Texas, reinvented shipping. He identified the cargo as the trailer rather than what the trailer was carrying, to reduce handling by the stevedores. In a sense, ships would be used as transoceanic ferries. The trailers could be stacked if the wheels were removed and the sides reinforced. As with most innovators and system integrators, McLean assembled building blocks together in a new way, finessing constraints. In 1947, American Overseas Chartering Corp., later trailer ships, offered overnight, roll-on, roll-off, or row-row, trailer ship service on the Hudson River. But this service soon faded as the New York Thruway was faster. Another ship, the Carib Queen, offered a similar service between Key West and Havana in the late 1950s. While row-row was the initial model, McLean thought beyond row-row. He obtained agreement from the Teamsters, who would benefit from additional trailer traffic. He also had to establish the transition between the Teamsters, who drove the trucks, and the longshoremen, who would handle the cranes that took the trucks from the shore to the ship. McLean bought a tanker company and modified its ships to carry detachable trailers. On April 26, 1956, McLean's Pan-Atlantic Steamship Company's Ideal X set sail from New York to Houston, inaugurating sea land service with 58 containers aboard. This differed from row-row intermodalism, which was, if not well established, at least not unknown, in that the container was detached from its running gear on the pier and hoisted onto the ship using dockside cranes. McLean's Ideal X mounted containers on a deck of a T2 tanker. Similarly, the first Matson ships placed containers on the deck of a Victory-class ship, see section 19.2. The first specially built container lines carried 200 TEUs. Financed by National City Bank of New York, later Citibank, McLean Trucking acquired Pan Atlantic sh Steamship in 1955 and then its parent, Waterman. To their mutual benefit, McLean's personal banker was Walter Riston, who eventually ran Citibank. To avoid regulatory problems, intermodal transportation cross ownership was prohibited. McLean placed the shares of his own trucking company in a blind trust. Notably, McLean Trucking was prohibited from providing the on road service from Sealand Services, newly renamed from Pan Atlantic. The railroads petitioned the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, to stop container traffic, but the ICC ruled in McLean's favor. The ICC concluded that the trailer was cargo rather than the items in the trailer, using as precedent the railroad trailers that the railroads carried. While McLean's innovation was mostly raw capitalism, his firms applied for and received insurance from the Federal Maritime Commission and tax advantages in terms of accelerated depreciation as a result of using converted warships as approved by the United States Office of Defense Mobilization. As this converted T-2 was a new type of ship, it had to undergo months of testing to persuade the U.S. Coast Guard and the American Bureau of Shipping of its seaworthiness. The ships were to be called, originally, Container Ship 1, Container Ship 2, and so on. But maritime tradition demanded names, as captains were less likely to go down with Container Ship 1 than a properly named vessel. The first four converted T-2 ships were named Ideal X, Almina, Koalinga Hills, and Maxton. In addition to containers, these also carried oil in their tanks. From 1957, converted C-2 ships like the Gateway City, the first all-container ship, launched carrying 226 containers. In addition to a new technology for the ships, new trailer trucks with removable containers also had to be designed. These were built by Brown Trailer and Frohoff Trailer, eventually in large numbers. The spacing between containers on board had to be carefully considered. Some space was required for the cranes to on and offload before cranes moved shoreside, but too much space would be wasteful. A tolerance of about 1 inch, 2.54 centimeters, between containers was established. The economic efficiency associated with containerization was profound. Unloading and loading a typical break bulk ship of the period would require 600 person days of labor, 150 stevedores working four days each. The Gateway City required 14 person days, 14 workers on one shift, 43 times less. Ships, like all capital-intensive transportation technologies, earn only when in motion. Time in port is lost, and so the profit-maximizing transportation firms aim to minimize it. 
Another advantage of containerization is reduction in theft, both simple pilferage by individual workers and systematic pilferage by organized crime, and reduced damage on ships buffeted by winds. McLean selected the 35-foot, 10.6-meter trailer as a standard, and this was the maximum length permitted by the state of Pennsylvania on highways. McLean forewent patents on his innovations to encourage industry standardization. The American Standards Association established a committee to set standards, and any length divisible by 10 feet, 3.05 meters, was permitted, and the industry converged on 20-foot and 40-foot as its practical standards, so that two connected 20-foot TEU, trailer equivalent unit, would equal one 40-foot unit. The American Standards Association also determined that any equipment such as refrigeration would be within the 20-foot container. With standardization and profits, service expanded. Competitor Graceline adopted 17-foot, 5.18-meter containers in its service to Latin America beginning in 1960. Union troubles in Venezuela delayed the unloading of the ship, and it took years for the issue to be fully resolved. Labor issues plagued the industry for years as unions resisted labor-saving technologies. Sealand inaugurated transatlantic container service in 1966 from New York to Rotterdam. Domestic container service would soon fall by the wayside. Sealand for many years preferred conversion of older vessels while other companies purchased new. This basically took the stern and machinery of one existing ship and constructed a new bow and midbody to create a new ship while the bow and midbody of the existing ship could be joined with the existing stern and machinery of another ship. In 1969, R.J. Reynolds took over Sealand, owning it until 1984. In 1986, CSX Railroads acquired it and held it until 1999. In 1984, newly deregulated emerged CSX acquired American Commercial Lines, a barge operator plying the U.S. inland waterways. CSX was aiming for seamless intermodal transport. CSX sold Sealand to Maersk, which became Maersk Sealand until eventually dropping the Sealand suffix. High oil prices constrained the market. All carriers ran into the problem that energy expenditure increased nonlinearly with speed. After 1973, all new Sealand vessels were diesel rather than steam. McLean personally acquired the historic United States lines in 1978, making capital intensive investments in econ ships large but slow to save energy costs. This did not pay off in the subsequent era of cheap energy, and the firm exited in 1986. Taiwan based Evergreen entered the market. Founded in 1968 by Yung Fa Chang, it expanded from a single brake bulk ship. In 1984, it inaugurated eastbound and westbound around the world service with 24 vessels. To compare with the 200 TEUs of the first 1950s era container ships, recently constructed vessels have been running 4,000 TEUs, with the most recent upscaling to 16,000 TEUs. Presently, about 90% of general cargo moves by containers stacked on ships. Over 200 million containers per year are now moved worldwide. Containerization was fast. From a mere footnote in the 1956 book, Marine Cargo Operations, containerization was essentially complete in 1971, when all containerizable cargo on the transatlantic route was containerized. Containerization takes an old idea, putting things in containers, which has been around since the first pots and barrels, and scaled it up using advanced technology. The scaling made many older, smaller ports obsolete and created a generation of new super ports that acted as hubs in a packet-based freight transportation system. Container shipping also changed railroads by bringing double stack container trains to the railroads with a low floor between the train's running gear. In addition to scale up and specialization, there have been increases in speeds. For example, cargo ships from 20 to 66 kilometers per hour, 11 to 36 knots, and tank ships from 20 to 26 kilometers per hour, 11 to 14 knots. However, fuel is a healthy part of operating costs, and to improve fuel efficiency, speeds have been reduced in some trades. The bulbous underwater bow section has been widely adopted, as have finer stern sections. Welding has largely replaced riveting. Low-speed diesels offer fuel efficiency advantages over turbines. Nineteen point two Matson's innovations. The Matson Navigation's Hawaiian merchant sailed on August thirty first, nineteen fifty eight, with forty three aluminum containers on deck, inaugurating Matson's early entry into container shipping. The Matson Research Corporation had recommended converting ships for up to 75 on-deck container movements and the follow-on step of having ships specially constructed for container service. Almost two years after the Hawaiian merchant sailed, the first specially designed Matson container ship Hawaiian Citizen launched in April 1960. How could we have innovation in risk-taking by an old liner company? Matson's experience was operating partly in domestic markets sheltered from foreign competition and in other markets where ship construction and operating subsidies applied. 
tightly regulated by government and traditions, system-changing innovation was out of the question. But does regulation always stifle innovation? For many years, owned by Hawaiian-based Alexander and Baldwin Incorporated, one of Hawaii's big five companies, Matson serves the California to Hawaii and the U.S. Pacific possessions trades with specialized container and automobile ships. Starting over 100 years ago with sailing ships in the Hawaii sugar trade, Matson is perhaps best remembered for Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Island passenger liners. Its rich and complex corporate history includes taking risks, betting on technology, and the spawning of associated companies for new ventures. For instance, betting on the future of air services in 1936 it joined with Pan American Airways to offer air services in Hawaii, and it established an airline subsidiary in 1943, only to have those endeavors thwarted by regulation. Inflation in the 1940s and 50s, along with labor strife at ports, forced Matson to seek and reseek increased tariffs, but these were strongly resisted. Increased liner size or velocity wasn't a route to, being, to increased productivity, and cost control because of the time required in port for gangs of 16 to 20 laborers to load and unload ships in the Hawaiian trade, a ship spent as much time in port as it did sailing. In the early 1960s, future Matson President Robert Pfeiffer led negotiations with International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union President Harry Bridges to establish the Mechanization and Modernization Agreement, governing the transition to containers. Like any good story, there was tension, conflict, gambling, and mystery. Matson's Hawaii market could be and was challenged by competitors, so failure could wreck the company, which was already shaken by losses of other markets. Should Matson take the bold step of being the first to offer container services throughout the Pacific? It took steps by arranging port terminals in Japan and the Philippines. Tensions were high as its board of directors' support waffled and bowed to the realities of current economic conditions, and there are Matson docks and places where Matson ships have never called. Mysteries included how to manage opposition by labor, the pace of market development, and the development of landside intermodal relations. Small containers were already in use serving mainly as lockboxes to thwart pilferage of valuable commodities. What size should general cargo containers be? Because many states had truck length limits, Matson elected 24 feet by 8 feet by 8.5 feet, or 7.3 by 2.4 by 2.6 meters, so that the containers could be moved as doubles, one on the truck and another on the trailer. Larger, high-cube containers came later. At ports, Matson saw the opportunity for land-based gantry cranes replacing shipborne cranes. Container movement equipment and sorting and storage asked for large docks. Innovative managers at Matson Docks in the Port of Oakland took risks and made investments. Those who stood aside, such as managers at the Port of San Francisco, were left behind as the predominant technology emerged in the format developed by Matson and others. In 2012, Alexander and Baldwin divested its Matson unit, which remains in the west coast of Hawaii market. Nineteen point three alliances. There were many, many companies providing shipping services, and in one sense, the industry demanded consolidation to achieve economies of scale. On the other hand, they were international, and every country had local champions and regulations and labor arrangements which worked against consolidation. As with domestic railroads in the United States, but unhindered by domestic laws, international conferences were established from the late eighteen hundreds to fix rate and activities. These still periodically bump up against antitrust regulations. In the 1960s, some of the older firms established consortia to enter the container market. Atlantic Container Line was a consortium of La Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, Cunard, Holland America, the Swedish American Line, Ruderi AB Transatlantic, and Valenius. It launched its first ship in 1967. Overseas Container Limited was a British consortium. Other container firms also launched in the late 1960s. Hapag Lloyd was a merger of Hamburg, American Line, and North German Lloyd. Like the more well-known airline alliances, see section 20.5.1, the Maritime Alliance era began in the 1980s when multiple firms would coordinate and carry each other's containers. Containership alliances in 1995 are shown in the figure. By 2003, the alliance structure evolved, with total capacity in TEUs given in parentheses, shown in the figure. In 2011, the Grand and New World Alliances combined, as have the Mediterranean Shipping Company and France's CMA-CGM. The alliances are legal agreements, filed with agencies such as the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission, allowing the parties to meet to discuss and rationalize in service in various ways, provide joint services, share revenue, distribute risks and liabilities, and act as a single organization when convenient. All of the agreements are now available online.
19.4, Container Ports. Containerization radically changed the scale and scope of maritime transportation. The growth of Asia as a manufacturing center led to the top four ports in 2000 and the top nine in 2010 being Asian, as shown in the figure. London, which is too far inland and served by too shallow a waterway, is no longer among the top ports, nor is New York City. All of 2000's top ports remained in the top 21 in 20, by 2010, but many of them slipped significantly. Port location affected port design. Port design figured into port evolution. Finger piers were popular in the United States where ports were adjacent to cities. In Europe, the ports were farther away from cities, and there was more land available for ships to sideload against the land. The mechanization of European ports was thus easier, as they did not need to relocate to serve the larger ships with larger cranes. The United States saw many once capable ports, New York City versus New Jersey, San Francisco versus Oakland, and Los Angeles, decline with containerization as the finger piers were ineffective and the land scarce. As far as policy goes, the American Association of Port Authorities has called for expanding sources for port development financing and revenues, balancing environmental regulation and economic development, providing waterside port access through dredging and dredged material disposal, securing resources for intermodal landside access to ports, using transportation trust funds for infrastructure development, not deficit reduction, and enhancing free and fair trade worldwide. Thus, for ports to grow, the Industry Association wants more sources for financing. They say that markets are insufficient and that ports would like subsidy. They want environmental regulations relaxed, but make no suggestion that they should pay for the externalities they generate. They want resources to expand landside access, and they want a free trade policy. Only the last comports with free market competition. Outside the United States, many ports like airports have been privatized. That may be a direction in which the United States heads in years to come. A problem for the United States is that East Coast ports are limited to 77,000 ton tank ships. Moreover, many important refinery facilities are located in ports that can only take 50,000 DWT ships. Japan and Western Europe have established VLCC facilities. San Francisco Bay can handle tank ships of about 100,000 DWTs. Prior to expansion, the Panama Canal was 32 meters wide, 106 feet, yielding about a 70,000 DWT tank or a 5,000 TEU. The standard for the maximum size ship that can traverse the canal is dubbed Panamax, and as of 2014, New Panamax. The New Panamax standard is 49 meters wide, allowing 13,000 TEUs. Other bottlenecks in the system, including the Straits of Malacca and the Suez, also have their own maximums. Nineteen point five labor arrangements. Steamship companies leased piers from New York City and contracted with stevedoring companies to provide labor, which was controlled by the International Longshoremen's Association, or ILA. Until just after World War II, longshoremen climbed onto cargo ships and, using brute force with the aid of nets and grappling hooks, moved small packages on and off ships. The process of loading and unloading might keep a ship in port for weeks. This break bulk shipping was a major bottleneck in world commerce. It enabled the longshoremen to become a powerful union, and operations were prone to theft. This was famously illustrated in the movie On the Waterfront, based on the reporting of Malcolm Johnson, beginning with the murder of Thomas Collentine. Waterfront corruption was aided by a surplus of labor. Union bosses would allocate jobs to workers, who had to show up at the union hall daily without knowing whether there would be work. These bosses would allocate jobs to workers who were in debt to loan sharks or otherwise bribed or given kickbacks. If you escaped debt, you did not get employed. The irregular schedule arises from the randomness of ship arrivals, requiring a surplus of labor. Ultimately, the reporting led to investigation by the Crime Commission, the expulsion of the ILA from the American Federation of Labor, and replacement of the union president, Joseph P. Ryan. With containerization, automation, and the rest of the logistics revolution, relations between management and labor remained raw. The amount of labor required per ton steadily declined, but labor remained unionized in the critical bottleneck in the transportation process. The question of who gets the rents, or profits, from the spatial monopoly is always contentious in transportation, and while strikes are becoming less and less common in industry, they remain relatively more visible in transportation. On July 1, 2002, the contract between the Pacific Maritime Association, PMA, the Industry Association for the Operators of 29 Ports on the West Coast of the United States, and the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, expired. This was of national importance because West Coast ports handle about $1 billion worth of freight daily. See the table for details. It was in many senses a classic dispute of capital versus labor. The PMA wanted to modernize technology such as introducing optical scanners and global positioning systems to automate information flows at the port. 
ILWU was concerned about employment of members and especially the use of non-union employees to replace members. However, the situation was somewhat atypical because union salaries ranged from $80,000 to $158,000 for what are normally considered blue-collar jobs, so the union had successfully captured many of the monopoly rents available from the ports during previous labor disputes. The ILWU had been established in 1937 as a breakaway from the East Coast-based International Longshoremen's Association, the ILA we previously mentioned. The union was forged in 1934 by a bloody West Coast waterfront strike and general strike in San Francisco. After many years of control by communist figures such as the Australian-born Harry Bridges, the ILWU remained an aggressive and powerful union. To illustrate their control, in September 2002, the ILWU, which controlled day-to-day work assignments, required that they be randomized and required strict adherence to safety regulations, a work-to-contract strategy. This policy, rather than allowing workers to conduct tasks in which they were skilled, resulted in productivity at the ports being reduced by 20 to 90 percent. The rationale for this was not simply to gain leverage over the PMA, but also to protest work conditions that had resulted in five deaths on the docks in the Los Angeles region in the previous five years. In response to this work slowdown on September 27th, the West Coast port operators shut down cargo terminals for 38 hours, and then on September 30th, the PMA closed ports until the ILWU agreed to either an extension of the existing contract or a new contract. This strategy locked out 10,500 workers from their jobs. The irony of this management labor dispute, which cost the economy hundreds of millions of dollars, was that the monetary difference between the two sides was estimated at only $20 million. Intentionally evoking images of the movie On the Waterfront, wherein former boxer and longshoreman Terry Malloy, played by Marlon Brando, has to choose whether to betray criminal union leaders on the New York, New Jersey ports or keep solidarity with his fellow workers, the PMA brought armed guards to the negotiations on October 1st, offending the union, or at a minimum, giving reason for the claim of offense. The United States Secretary of Labor, Elaine Chao, who later became Secretary of Transportation in the Trump administration, tried to intervene in the negotiations. However, she failed to negotiate a contract extension that would reopen the ports for 30 days. The ILWU supported an end to this lockout, but the PMA resisted, believing the union would continue to work to rules. A board of inquiry established by the federal government to investigate the issues reported, We have no confidence that the parties will resolve the West Coast ports dispute within a reasonable time. This finding set the stage for the beginning of the invocation of the Taft-Hartley Act, On October 9th, President George W. Bush sought and received a federal district court order requiring the West Coast ports to reopen. On November 1st, a tentative agreement was reached. The management desire to cut clerk jobs and introduce more computer technology was agreed to, resulting in cuts of 400 marine clerk jobs. In exchange, however, it was agreed that the new jobs created would be union jobs. In addition, agreements had to be negotiated about pension security, health insurance benefits, higher wages, and safety provision. The details were worked out by November 24th for a six-year contract. Chief Federal Mediator Peter Hurtgen said negotiations demonstrated statesmanlike leadership, which made this contract agreement possible. The ILWU membership voted after Thanksgiving in favor of the contract. A short strike in autumn 2012 by clerical workers represented by the ILWU, concerned about outsourcing, also shut down the West Coast ports as longshoremen would not cross picket lines. This strike was quickly ended. The 2002 West Coast port strike was the first application of the Taft-Hartley Act in ports since President Richard Nixon employed it in 1971 to stop another longshoreman strike, the last major work stoppage at the West Coast ports, which had lasted for 134 days. A Republican Congress, overriding President Harry Truman's veto, passed Taft-Hartley in 1947. The law had a number of provisions. It outlawed the closed shop in which only union members would be hired, but it permitted a union shop which required non-union workers to join the union. More to the point of this discussion, Taft-Hartley provided for a 60-day cooling-off period after a contract expires before a strike may be called. Moreover, the president may extend that period by 80 days. After that period, the National Labor Relations Board has 15 days to poll employees to see whether they will accept management's final proposal and an additional five days to count votes. Then, if the workers reject the proposal, they can strike. However, this seldom-used procedure serves mostly as a threat. Prior to 2002, it was last used to calm a 1978 coal strike. Not surprisingly, unions oppose these provisions, referring to the act as plain old slavery. Nineteen point six discussion. Recent, and we expect continuing trends in shipping include 
more use of computers and communications, not so much to reduce manning, but to track cargo, including identity-preserved cargo, and for security checks, better fuel efficiency through continued improvements in engine, ship, propeller, and rudder designs, continued rise in ship size, this is limited by physical constraints, for example, the newly enlarged Panama Canal, or harbor depths, the increase in size should improve efficiency, but other impacts are uncertain. East Coast U.S. ports would need expensive dredging to accommodate larger ships. Historically, clipper ships were partly done in by the opening of the Suez Canal, shortening routes for steam-powered ships. Further development of hubbing ports, such as Singapore and Rotterdam, in part to gain economies of scale in shipping. Specialization in increasing sizes of containers, though again, constraints, easy transfer to trucks or trains, play a role. Simultaneous loading of multiple containers, stacks, to speed up port turnaround. On-ship devices for stowing containers. Continued specialization of ships of all types. Neo-bulk ships have emerged. These are bulk carriers specialized to new trades, and they range from scrap and lumber carriers to auto carriers. Such items were once carried as general cargo, and specialized chemical, wine, and so on ships have been developed for other former general cargo commodities. Dry bulk ships have scaled up to 270,000 DWTs. Passenger ships also scaled up to large sizes. Today, the Queen Mary II is about 150,000 tons, but with the advent of air competition, they are now largely deployed in the resort trades. Since the logistics revolution, shipping has been reborn, grown, and matured again, and though it is still evolving, change is again coming slowly. There may be a new logistics revolution like containerization around the corner, speedy giant ships from transatlantic and transpacific trade. If trends continue, the number of important ports will decline with the size of ships, but those few ports will continue to expand in size. The remaining constraints will continue to be the canals and the harbors.